In this video, we will examine how to solve for the subgame perfect Nash equilibrium of sequential games. By the end of this video, you should be able to completely describe the set of strategies available to, pl to a player in a sequential game, find the Nash equilibria of a sequential game, and use backward induction to solve for the subgame perfect Nash equilibrium of a sequential game. To begin, let's review the steps to solve strategic games. First, start by setting up an appropriate diagram of the game, whether that be an extensive form of the game or a strategic form. Normally, for a sequential game, you would use the extensive form, although it is possible to convert extensive form games into strategic form games. Second, define each player's strategy set. In a sequential game, it is possible for a player to have dominant or dominated strategies. So you can proceed to solve the game by looking for dominant strategies or eliminating dominated ones. During the course of this video, we will discover that when we find pure strategy Nash equilibria of the game, some of these equilibria will not make sense. So instead, what we will do is find a subset of these Nash equilibria called subgame perfect Nash equilibria. As we often do, we will start with an example. This diagram illustrates the extensive form of a game called the centipede game. In the centipede game, play alternates between two players, player A and player B. At each player's turn, they get the opportunity to either stop the game or continue to the next round. As you can see from the payoffs, which are color-coded, if a player stops, they get more money than if they choose to continue and their opponent stops the game on the next round. However, if they continue and then their opponent continues as well, they have the potential to increase their earnings. To solve the game, the first thing that we need to do is define each player's strategy set. Remember that a strategy is a complete plan of action for each decision node that the player could possibly encounter in the game, including those nodes that they may never get to play because of something that they do or something that their opponent does earlier in the game. To define each player's strategy, we will start by counting how many decision nodes each player has. Player A has two decision nodes, the first node in the game and the node that occurs if both players choose to continue on their first move. Therefore, a strategy or a complete plan of action for player A must contain two parts. What to do at node 1? and what to do if both players choose continue on their first move. Given that player A has two possible actions at each node, that means that player A has four possible strategies. Always continue, continue and then stop, stop and then continue, and always stop. If strategies three and four seem a bit strange to you, I ask you to bear with me for now. A strategy is a complete plan of action, so it must include a plan for player A for their second node, even if it means that they'll never get to execute that plan if they play the first part of their strategy correctly. For now, you can think about the second part of those strategies as a contingency plan. What player A would do if for some reason they made a mistake when executing the first part of their strategy? We can go through the same procedure for player B. Player B also has two decision nodes. The first one occurs if player A starts the game by choosing continue, and the second one occurs if player A chooses continue on both of their turns, and player B also chooses continue on their first turn. This means that player B also has four possible strategies. Always choosing continue, continuing and then stopping, stop and then continue, and always stopping. Remember that the complete set of possible strategies from which a player can choose is called a player's strategy set. To find the equilibrium of the game, the first thing that we will do is convert the game from extensive form to strategic form. 
Since each player has four possible strategies, we will need a 4x4 table. We will put player A's strategies in the rows and player B's strategies in the columns. Then, we will fill in the table with each player's payoffs. Remember that player A's payoffs are listed first. We can start by looking for dominant strategies for both players. Hopefully, it is obvious to you that neither player has a strategy that is always better, so neither player has any strictly dominant strategy. It is also the case that neither player has any strategies that are always worse than some other strategy, so neither player has any strictly dominated strategies either. If you're not sure about this, pause the video and check for yourself before moving on. Our next step will be to find all of the pure strategy Nash equilibria of the game. Given the size of this game, we will use the best response method to find the pure strategy Nash equilibria. If you are unfamiliar with this method, you may want to review the video on Nash equilibria before continuing. We will start by finding all of player A's best responses to player B's possible strategies. If player B chooses to always continue, then player A's best response is to always continue as well. If player B's strategy is continue then stop, then player A's best response is also continue then stop. If player B's strategy involves stopping on their first move, then player A's best response is to stop on their first move as well. We will use the same method to find player B's best responses to each of player A's possible strategies. If player A chooses to always continue, player B's best response is to continue, then stop. If player A chooses to continue, then stop, then player B's best response is to stop on their first move. If player A chooses to stop on their first move, then player B never gets to play the game. So any of their possible strategies are a best response to player A's strategies that involve stopping on the first move. Therefore, we have found four pure strategy Nash equilibria to this game. Both players playing stop continue, one player playing stop stop, and the other player playing stop continue, and both players playing stop stop. Now that we've found these equilibria, we should ask ourselves a question. How believable are these equilibria in which one player says that if the game progresses to their second decision node, they will choose to continue? Or, asked another way, if the game advances to the second node, will a player really keep their promise to continue at that point? Hopefully, your answer to this question is probably not. The reason why is that it would not be rational for a player to do so. To see why, let's look at the extensive form of this game. Let's consider the Nash equilibrium in which player A chooses the strategy stop continue and player B chooses the strategy stop stop. Suppose that both players made a mistake on their first move so that player A finds themselves at the second decision node. Their strategy says that they should play continue, but is that really the best decision for player A? The answer is no. Player A would be better off by stopping, since if they continue, they know that player B will stop and player A will only get 80 cents versus $1.60 if they stop right away. We can make the same argument about the other two Nash equilibria that involve at least one player continuing at their second decision node. All of these Nash equilibria contain promises that are not believable. Since players are choosing to stop at their first decision node, they don't really have to follow through on these promises anyway. This example has revealed a weakness in the concept of a Nash equilibrium when solving sequential games. The weakness is that the Nash equilibrium does not require that all portions of a player's strategy be optimal, but only those portions of a strategy that a player actually has to play. 
This is why strategies like stop continue can be part of a Nash equilibrium. Because the player never has to play the second part of the strategy, it doesn't really matter what the second part of the strategy actually is. If we want an equilibrium that contains optimal actions for every possible point in the game that a player could ever encounter, we need a stronger condition than the Nash equilibrium. This condition is called the subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. To find the subgame perfect Nash equilibrium, you must solve for each player's optimal action at each subgame of the game. For sequential games of perfect information, a subgame is a decision node and everything that comes after it in the game. This game has four subgames. The first subgame starts at player B's second decision node and includes everything after it. The second subgame starts at player A's second decision node and includes everything that follows it. The third subgame starts at player B's first decision node and includes everything that follows. And finally, the fourth subgame is the entire game. Notice how we found these subgames. We started at the end of the game and worked our way back to the beginning. This is not an accident. It is because to solve for the subgame perfect Nash equilibrium, we will start at the end of the game and work our way back to the beginning using a process called backward induction. Let's solve the centipede game using backward induction. We will keep track of each player's optimal action at each node, which ultimately will give us each player's subgame perfect Nash equilibrium strategy for the game. We will start by solving the first subgame. In this subgame, player B will make $3.20 if they choose stop or $1.60 if they choose continue. Clearly, player B will choose stop. So, we can fill in this portion of player B's strategy. Then, we can delete this subgame and move the payoffs from player B's optimal strategy up to the next level of the game. In this subgame, player A will get 80 cents if they choose continue and $1.60 if they choose stop. Therefore, player A's optimal choice is stop. We can fill in this portion of player A's strategy, delete the subgame, and move the payoffs up to the next subgame. Once again, player B's optimal action is to choose stop. In the last subgame, player A's optimal action is also to choose stop. We have now found the subgame perfect Nash equilibrium of this game. It involves both players choosing stop at every decision point in the game. Let's note a couple things about this equilibrium. The first thing to note is that not all Nash equilibria are subgame perfect Nash equilibria. When we started analyzing this game, we found four pure strategy Nash equilibria. Only one of these equilibria is a subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. The second thing to notice is that subgame perfect Nash equilibria can only contain threats or promises that are credible. By this, we mean that if a player is threatening to play a given action as a part of their strategy later in the game, then in order for it to be credible, it must be rational for the player to actually follow through on that threat or promise later in the game if they get the opportunity to do so. As an example, let's consider a player's threat to stop at their second decision node. This threat is credible because, as we saw earlier when we solved for the subgame perfect Nash equilibrium, a player will make more by stopping than by continuing. Therefore, the decision to stop is a payoff maximizing decision and the threat to stop is a credible threat. In contrast, the promise to continue is not credible, because by doing so, a player will only lower their payoff. Thus, we can see that no strategy that includes the choice to continue at a decision node can be part of a subgame perfect Nash equilibrium for this game. 
This concludes this video on solving for subgame perfect Nash equilibria for strategic games. Thank you for watching.